Um, my name is Kenny Arnett. That's my official name on the screen. And the Transpersonal Institute for the Scientific Study of the Paranormal was the longest nickname I could think of for myself. In fact, I am the only member of the Institute at this point, and um, <laughs> proudly so. And I am on a quest for like-minded people to join me, so I'm fully aware that there may be no like-minded people. But if you find yourself to be like-minded and would like to collaborate or interact with me in any way, please feel free to contact me at my email address at the bottom of the screen. It's also in your uh, program. And my <laughs> laser pointer is red and small. It's not like Mark's, which was big and green. So Mark has a bigger pointer than I do. <laughs> but size doesn't matter. Um, by the way, I have two PhDs. One is in physical chemistry and the second one in clinical psychology. And in the program, one of those has been removed from me. So I fully expect, since consciousness determines reality, when I return home, one of my diplomas will be missing. <laughs> However, I point that out because I'm going to incorporate some of these ideas later. I want you to know what my background is. So um, without further ado, let me figure out how to, how do you do that? Mark, how do I do a page down? I'm sorry, I did this in Word rather than PowerPoint. I speak PowerPoint poorly. Ah, okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to start with what I call my version of the standard model. Particle physicists use a different model for what they call the standard model. But the standard model for me is what were the basic elements of everything we know about for classical physics. And those four elements were energy, matter, space, and time. Relativity from Einstein showed us that matter and energy could be united. In fact, matter was an altered form of energy and that uh, we should really properly use the term matter energy to describe the commingling of the two. Furthermore, whoops, yeah, this is going to be a little tricky till I get it. Space and time, <laughs> having a little trouble with both. Space and, <laughs> space and time can also be united on the same screen at the same time into space time under general relativity. And that is a four-dimensional construct. Further, the most recent theory of everything, the major contender for that title at the moment, string theory, suggests that perhaps matter energy and space-time can further be reduced to simply energy. And so if you accept string theory, then everything is energy in one form or another. I'm aware that there is at least one person, unless you work Dobbins' theory you are, there's at least one person in this room that does not like string theory. And that's okay. I just want to make you aware that it's possible, it's conceivable, that we could unite space, time, energy, and matter all into one rubric called energy. I'm not going to be satisfied with that, however. That didn't work. I'm not satisfied with my own program. Part two what I call the standard model, is off the screen. Is the standard model of the origin of consciousness as it stands now. That is among non-heretics. I am a heretic. Energy is the basis of everything. And therefore, people in consciousness studies have tried to explain consciousness as some form of energy. And the general flow of the idea is that energy is the most basic component of everything. Matter is constructed from energy, as Einstein taught us. And consciousness, if matter is sufficiently complex, is generated by matter, and perhaps matter in cooperation with energy. 
but consciousness is reducible to matter and therefore to energy. I have a problem with that idea. I don't believe that's right. But here are some points that the standard model will make. I'm just going to leave it there. Brains and computers are sufficiently complex forms of matter with energy to generate consciousness according to the standard view. That leaves room for conscious computers, advanced artificial intelligence and so forth. And secondly, consciousness is explained by either neuroscience or quantum physics or C, the combination of the two, what I call the unholy chimera. I call it that because even though I have training and experience in both neuroscience and quantum physics, and I think both are very important, I don't think either one or the combination of the two explains, quote unquote, consciousness. However, I do think that consciousness interacts with the brain, and I think that consciousness interacts with the physical universe on a quantum level. So I, I do not mean to attack Dean Radin's work, which I admire tremendously. I think that the, that is just really important stuff, and I'm not poo-pooing it here. I'm really, I'm poo-pooing someone who isn't here, Stuart Hameroff, if anyone knows that name, and his theory of uh, microtubules and quantum physics as the basis for consciousness. I don't think that's right. David Chalmers, who is a contemporary philosopher of mind, has refined consciousness studies to what he calls the hard problem of consciousness. And the short way of saying it is, why does the feeling that accompanies awareness of sensory information exist at all? In other words, why is the operation of the brain accompanied by subjectivity or subjective experience or awareness or consciousness? I use all those terms roughly interchangeably. The question really can be phrased as, why doesn't everything happen in the dark? Presumably my refrigerator, my television, even my rudimentary computer does things, do things, without being conscious of it. I don't think my fridge knows that it's freezing the ice cubes. I don't think my computer knows that I'm upset with it for what it did with my Word file. So it is straightforward to suppose that the physical brain operates without any self-awareness. Chalmers says this is the hard problem. And by the way, he says all other problems are the easy problems. And you might want to disagree with that, and, and, and I think that there aren't any really easy problems, except for the hard problem. I think it's the easiest problem of all, and I'll explain why I say that. His solution, Chalmers' solution to his own question, he calls naturalistic dualism. He says that consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe. It is not reducible to matter or energy. It is ontologically autonomous. I love that word, or that pair of words, of any known physical properties. It is not reducible to matter or energy or the interaction between the two. I agree with him on that. But, there's a but. Whoops, I missed the but. But, the physical world is causally closed, so that physical events only have physical causes. Therefore, the brain and human behavior are not anything separate from physical explanations. There I disagree with him. And here he appears to be saying that consciousness really can't influence the physical world, almost like the epiphenomenal view of consciousness. However, he's not saying that consciousness is reducible to matter, and that's where he differs from the epiphenomenalists. So questions generated by the standard model include, but are not limited to, how can matter, the most tangible and least ephemeral thing known, generate consciousness, which is just the reverse. It is the least tangible and most ephemeral thing that we know. Secondly, what is the mechanism of such a generation? It appears to be impossible to me. And third, how does the standard model explain anomalies of human experience, especially those that are death-related? And I include in that list near-death experiences, after-death communications, reincarnation, and mediumship. I think these are the most important anomalies that we can deal with.
So I'm going to accelerate rapidly. Chalmers model also begs questions such as what is consciousness? What's its relationship with matter, energy, and space-time? Does it reside within matter, energy, or is it free-floating in some sense? And how can it be irreducible yet have no effect on matter and energy or the brain? My answer is at the moment, this is a work in progress for sure. The hard problem is hard because it's the wrong question. Matter does not generate consciousness. Therefore, there is no mystery about how it does. It doesn't. In a logical and intuitive sense, the standard model has things badly out of order. That is completely wrong. We should begin with the most ephemeral and end with the least. And we can look to relativity for an example of this way of thinking. Einstein told us that energy was mass times the square of the speed of light. We can rearrange that equation to say that mass is energy divided by the square of the speed of light. That's how it's usually interpreted, although not usually written. But that's what basically Einstein was telling us. Matter is constituted of energy in a highly compact form. And here I've just said what I just said. And again. Energy is usually defined as the ability to do work. But this is not a good definition. It's a property, an, an ability, an aspect, or an attribute. It's not a definition. And in fact, I can quote Richard Feynman as saying, and I won't read the whole thing here, as saying that the conservation of energy is a very abstract idea, not a description of a mechanism or anything concrete, just a strange fact. And if conservation of energy is a strange, weird fact, energy itself is also strange. The fact is, we don't really know what energy is. It's just that that's where physics stops in explaining things. An alternative viewpoint, substance. I'll define substance as anything that, can, uh, that has an independent ontological status. It can exist independently of anything else. This is best seen as a type of thing. So matter is a substance. Energy is a substance. And I'm going to tell you that consciousness is also a substance. And I'm going to, to go further than that. The hypothesis is that energy is a highly concentrated form of consciousness, just as matter is a highly concentrated form of energy. In other words, consciousness is the most fundamental thing. So I put it in a form that may bring back feelings of fear from the SAT. Consciousness is to energy as energy is to matter. That's my idea of a hierarchy of substances. Consciousness is the primary substance. All else is built from it. So consciousness is foundational, and there is no hard problem. But I hint here, there are others. There are always more problems brought up by any solution to one problem. A hierarchy of substances then would be the primary substance is consciousness itself. I give it a capital C for a symbol. Energy is a function in some sense of consciousness. I hold out the possibility that you could actually write down a functional definition of energy from basic constitutive consciousness. I don't know what that function is. I'm not going to, to pretend I do. I also don't know that it can be done, but I'm holding out the possibility. And the tertiary substance, as we, uh, if we accept string theory for the moment, is strings. Strings are made of energy, and in the case of matter, we have Einstein's equation reversed, m equals e times c to the minus 2. Strings come in two types. These are very tiny strands of energy. Open-ended strings are photons and matter. Closed-loop strings, I can't say about anything about it because I'm out of time. But uh, that's where some of the real interesting stuff happens. And so this is the, the order of things, the hierarchy of things, the nature of things as I see it. If we take this as the way things are, then I think this hierarchy is logical because it's in the order of increasing tangibility, decreasing ephemerality. Is that a word? Um, it's easier for me, at least, to envision a constitutive energy matter, a consciousness relationship than some way in which matter could produce consciousness. Consciousness is thus the primordial substance. Some of its properties include self-awareness, subjectivity, and irreducibility. And then finally, consciousness condenses into energy, losing its self-aware properties. If there are any left, when it condenses, when energy condenses into matter, there is none left. So energy and matter are not conscious themselves, but they're composed of it, and they exist independently of it once they're created. 
In the view of this hypothesis, the death-related anomalies are really no longer anomalies. Hasta la vista, hard problem. I would take a minute to talk about how this compares with some famous philosophical positions, but I don't have time. I would take time to talk about the problems with this approach, but oops, I'm out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. There's time for a few questions. Maybe I'll start with one. Um, so you and, and the other speakers in this session, it sounds like, agree that really subjectivity and consciousness are the basis for everything. So what is the cosmological view then? Does that mean that there was nothing before there was consciousness? And what consciousness? Garrett. Another hard question. Could you start with some hard questions? <laughs> um, in my view, there was never a time before consciousness existed. Consciousness is eternal, always was, always will be. That's maybe punting, but it's the best I can do. And the rest of your question was what? OK. <laughs> well, that was a, a nice, elegant answer for a hard question. Uh, so my hard question is, wh what do you think is the mechanism of condensation of consciousness? Does it have anything to do with physical laws that we know? And, or, and does it have anything to do with uh, bl black holes and the mechanism that they condense into singularity? Glenn. Boy. I was expecting most of these questions, and I can't answer most of these questions. I, I, physics cannot tell us how energy condenses into matter. Physics just tells us that it does. Likewise, I cannot tell you how consciousness condenses into energy. I just believe that it does. I cannot devise an experiment that shows that it does. I think in the physical world, those questions lie beyond our ability to, to comprehend. Again, I'm punting because I literally don't know even how to approach answering the question. It's a great question. It's one I've contemplated often, deeply, and come up with nothing. So it's uh, the perfect question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask your comments on the adaptation of your theory to energy as energy medicine, which is my field of endeavor, because most energy medicine practitioners and leaders in the field believe that there is a consciousness within various forms of energy modalities that actually der drives the energy to know what to do. It's a very simple way of explaining it, so that energy and consciousness are actually one and the same thing in a lot of forms of energy therapies. Your comments on that? I'm familiar with some of those areas, although I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. I think that consciousness directs the energy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the energy, the, the consciousness resides within the energy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the energy is conscious. Mm -hmm. I think in, consciousness directs it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll refer you to Dr. Radin for examples, mm -hmm. experimental examples of how that works. Yes, he's one of my huge fans too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, he's, he's got a much better handle on that than I do. But I don't believe that energy is inherently conscious, yeah. even though it's composed of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Once it's created, it's unconscious, mm -hmm. kind of like me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for a very fascinating presentation. Thank you. Uh, consciousness drives the energy. I, I do agree. So my question is, why not divide in your model the building blocks and the forces, information, energy, mass, consciousness, field, force. Why not? <laughs> I hate to answer a question with a question. That, that, I think you've gone way beyond me there. We probably need to talk about that. Thank you once again. Thank you.